and no, no, Orkless doesn't clear out Sandwich. And two for Mark, a third! And same gunplay from Mark. Another down, this time on two Lems. Fabian will clean up. Oh, and he goes for it! Unbelievable! Fabian with the three P. What's up, people, and welcome to Esports in 30, where we take a deep dive into different esports each day of the week. Today is Friday, and that means it's time for the FPSs to take center stage. I'm Marissa Roberto, and this, of course, is Zurich. We're happy to have him back on the couch every Friday, baby. Every Friday. Because this Friday in particular, we have a certain Canadian caster because he's been bugging us that we've been doing this for three weeks, and uh, we haven't covered Rainbow Six yet. I mean, yeah, rightfully so. Like, there yeah. is, we've missed 10 weeks already. There's four new maps, there was an invitational, sorry, four new operators, two yeah. new maps, there was an invitational tournament, there was a team that got picked up, a team yeah. disbanded, there's a lot to talk about, so we should get into it. Okay, probably. now, of course, to make up for this, and also because he's bugging me, uh, we asked that certain caster to join us to get all caught up, so we'll uh, ring him up while you guys check out this highlight pack from the NA Pro League. to be the smoke rushing out and shuttle gets picked apart by BC who's just lying prone allowing these towers in front of him to give him tons of opportunity BC picking everybody apart can he get the third no it's NVK to get the kill and a spray shuttle now with three kills shotgun in hand not enough to flick on to Geo softball in the back vertical has full HP and time is on his side. All he needs to do is just to move in, find the kill. They're gonna try to stick it. No, the IQ turns around for the oh kill. My. Oh, Geo, he does it! Makes him push his way in and start attempting a plan. In behind the bomb, though, Mark will pick him down. BC with an immediate refrag on Disguise, though. Another plant attempt coming out from Mint. The Nitro Cell will go soaring, oh. and it'll end the round. Laxing will connect. Flashed up, but stuck in the crossfire. It's really hard to get this engagement in his favor. He will finally take out Shala, but it's his team falling one after another, putting more pressure on Mint. Able to get two. His last teammate, though, Kojo, at the bottom of main stairs. That three for Mint. Incredible pistol play, and he has the Diffuser. Going for the plant behind Black Box. This is the perfect position for him to plant solo. Hojo's doing his best to cover, but he's gonna lose the fight to Redeemer, forcing Mint into an ace situation. He's gonna get the 4K! He has the mirror window and the flash, and he gets it! The ace from Mint! He's waiting to hold this down, and no, no, Orglis doesn't clear out Sandwich, and two for Mark, a third! And same gunplay from Mark, and he gets a fourth of the down on Yeti. He doesn't know it yet, but he has a potential 4K waiting for him to claim. If he just gets a little bit aggressive, it might have been called out by his team, and he will make that push happen. Brian now the last alive, and Mark goes for it with the pistol out. Will he get it? Oh, yes! A 5K from Mark! Oh, it's gonna be the Alda in the hands of NVK! Two monstrous kills! Waiting through what could be a trap set by the remaining attackers. He sees Unreal peek around the corner, cannot detach his head from his neck. It's oh. he'll do it to Acid. Takes an opportunity to reload. He's going to push on up. He might actually see the end. Oh. NVK, the clutch! So if that highlight pack didn't give it away, we're going to start our discussion of Siege with what's been happening in North America. And here to give us that lowdown is Parker in Taro McKay. What's up, bud? I'm doing well. How are you? Thanks for having me on again. I mean, we're good. We're happy to have you finally. I know you've been bugging me about it. So here we are, <laughs> here we uh, are. finally talking R6, my God. Let's start at the top of the table and work our way down, okay? So um, Dark Zero is obviously sitting on top here. They established themselves as a serious contender in the Pro League. Um, BC is now back to being a starting member. So how has BC fit into the team since the return to play? And how has he contributed overall to their success this season of Pro League? Uh BC has gone back to the old roles that he used to be on, mm. you know, the team that he played on before, which was Evil Geniuses, which is this kind of supportive entry role. Uh, I, I don't think putting him on the roles of the person who he replaced, Pojo Man, was a smart idea. They didn't do that. I think it's a wise choice to put him on what he's really comfortable with. And I got to say, I'm, I'm really, I'm really impressed with the fact that he manages to not be in pro league mm. for, you know, a season and a half and just step right in and just kill it he's absolutely killing it and it looks like he hasn't missed a single beat uh, it's it's good to have him back because i've always thought he was a, a heck of a player and mm. it's nice to see that the team is is doing well with him oh my god he sounded so canadian there a heck of a player <laughs> um do you think this form is sustainable for dark zero when compared to your eg your rex rogues mm. of the scene 
Uh, I want to say yes. I, I mean, here's the biggest problem with this Dark Zero roster is that they always come so tantalizingly close to success, and then they always seem to fall short at the very final minute, whether this be in game or whether this be in the in the standings through the course of a season. And I got to say, like, you know, last season they came down to the very final round of the very final matchup as to whether or not they would be representing their region, mm. and they lost a rogue in heartbreaking fashion for their fans. Mm. And this season seems to be uh, par for the course in terms of seasonal success. The real question is, as we start to grind down towards the very final games, which we're, we're at now, right? There's only four games left. It's crazy to me to think that there's still a possibility that despite having such a good season, that Dark Zero could still fall short in the final you know, game or final two games. It'd be nice to see them at land, so I'm kind of hopeful mm -hmm. that they make it, but if past success is any indicator, then it's going to be a tense couple games for them and their fans. Um, I do want to talk about fan favorite EG because it seems like Geo is 100% settled in at this point. Second place in Pro League, but only by one point. So where is EG now following their upset loss to Rack at the Invitational? Oh boy, that was quite a match. Mm. Uh, EG's success on LAN over the last little while has been not great, mm. and I'm really interested to know how they're going to do through the next four games. You know, NA is super competitive. The top five teams in North America right now are all in a position where they can all make it to LAN, they can all come to Milan and really represent their region appropriately. But I don't know what's going on with EG at LAN appearances, but they always seem to fall short now. And their loss to Wreck in the first round, not great. You know, they got first rounded in Rio. Uh, you know, they. It's it's been an interesting run for this EG squad, and I, I'd imagine at some point they're going to be able to be able to find that groove and, and regain their momentum. But when is the real question? Right. Do you think that they're still the best team in NA? Hmm. Uh, I would say probably still ever so slightly, mm. but they've got competition from Reciprocity. They've got competition from Rogue. They've got competition now from Dark Zero and Space Station's woes over the regular season are really masking uh, what is a great team on LAN. So I would imagine that if Space Station makes it to any LAN that they're going to continue to do as well as they have in the past. I mean, they gave G2 a heck of the run for their money at the Invitational. The real question is just does Space Station make it to LAN mm. or not? Uh, NA is super competitive right now, so while EG might still be the best, I kind of hesitate to say that they are dis indisputably the best. Hmm. Um, we need to talk about another team, obviously, in NA, which is Reciprocity. Um, they had a very strong showing at the Invitational, so how did the change in org and or roster kind of bring them to the sky and in Skies help this um, to reach their potential? Did he help them? Skies was a massive uh, contributing factor to yeah. why this team does as well as it does. They really needed some extra firepower and some aggression. They got that, you know, moving Mark to a full bona fide supporting role uh, has been terrible for Mark's stats, but yeah. has been really good for the team. And obviously, when you take somebody like Skies, who has incredible aim and is able to kill almost everything you put in front of him, that's going to do really well for your team. Reuniting him with Laxing, playing aggressively off of Fox A. Skies' contributions have been really good. And the other thing that I want to compliment Skies on is that uh, on previous squads, we all as casters have been quite critical of the fact that he doesn't really play with the team. Mm. And he's playing a lot tighter with them. He's allowing Laxing to be the one who's playing this lurker, playing way off site, playing, you know, just like kind of aggressively looking for picks on his own. And it works really well with both Skies and Laxing's play style, but you can really only have one on a team. Mm. So I'm glad that Skies is playing closer with the rest of his squad because they're they're doing better in matches. And, you know, we, we saw them fall real short against G2 in the semis of the six Invitational, but I think mm. there's a lot of potential on this roster despite that. What do you think is the ceiling for the squad then? Do you mm. think they're like a top contender? I would say so. I think that they have the tools to be the best team in North America. It's just whether they're going to be able to put it all together um, you know, because it, on paper, they're a great team. They have pretty much everything they need. They've got a couple weak spots here and there. But overall, I don't think their weaknesses are any greater than, you know, any other team in North America. Their biggest knock right now tends to be that they don't seem to be the most prepared for their matches. And they don't seem to be the most flexible in match. And they rely a lot on individual performances to carry them through. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at Laxing's performance against Rise Nation on Monday as a, as a pretty good example of that. 
Um, you mentioned Rogue earlier because they do seem to be finding their footing here. They're recovering from a rough start at the Pro League and an early exit at the Invitational. But what steps need to be taken for Rogue to actually reclaim their top two in an A spot? I mean, the math is still there for Rogue to be able to get up there. Uh, it's been a bit of a slog for them. This has been, I think, and you can't, I can't quote me on this because I don't actually have the numbers in front of me right now, but I think statistically this has been their worst season since, mm. uh, you know, since we've been really monitoring this over the last couple seasons, last year or so. And I, I honestly don't know what it is. There are some games where it looks like they just fall off of a cliff, whether mm. it's people not really coming alive or whether them relying a lot on vertical to carry that team and possibly even Eclipse. And then if one of them goes quiet, then that, that becomes a problem. Obviously, Eclipse moving to more support roles alongside easily was a change for the roster. It really did kind of carve out new roles for everybody on the team. Vertical's a great player, but if he gets shut down, then I worry about Rogue's fragging potential beneath him. Shuttle shows up on a lot of matches and can be very dependable, but he's not the same type of player as Vertical is. So. I don't know if it's simply coordination. I don't know if it, if it's team comms or what, but there's something there that Rogue still needs to do to find that you know that fifth, that sixth gear and, and really kick it up because NA is getting tougher by the week yeah. and Rogue is running out of time to make it. Damn. Um, so there's been a lot of big changes roster-wise in uh, the NA scene, mm -hmm. and this doesn't usually happen in any of the pro leagues, but. A team just disbanding because there there's not enough players. Hmm. What's happening in the in the scene? Is there just like a lack of of uh, skill talent, or yeah. talent maybe, or uh, what's happening? I have no clue hmm. what internally was happening with that Orgless squad. You know, they they were playing under the Org Noble, and then you know they they left the Org or the Org dropped them. I don't know the exact. Uh, contractual agreement that was or wasn't there and then next thing you know uh, they're playing Orglas mm -hmm. which was their title and they weren't making a salary or anything like that and I think it's I think it's worth noting that when you don't have contracts and you're not making a lot of money you mm -hmm. can go anywhere you want you're not bound by a contract to stay with that team and we saw both you know Crazy and Acid went to Rise Nation yeah. to go you know get paid you can't really blame them for that one and then the, the team's decision to drop my man was I think a bit premature yeah. but at the end of the day they I, I don't know if they had trouble acquiring an organization because they weren't doing the hottest and then you know maybe an org doesn't want to take a gamble on them when there's auto relegation in the picture and yeah. maybe Maybe they were worried that this team didn't have a lot of potential and would probably end up getting auto relegated. So why bother signing them? I'm not sure mm -hmm. the logistics behind it, but it was a bit disappointing to see the team disband. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad that most of the players have recovered. You know, you got Brian on Space Station yet. He's now down in Challenger League. So at least there's a good home for all the people who left the roster. Well, in your eyes then, Parker, what steps can be taken to ensure proper stability for teams and to make sure the situation doesn't happen again? I mean, as long as there's auto relegation in place, there's mm -hmm. not going to be as much stability. And I think that's just a hard truth. Right now, every single region is guaranteed to lose one of the teams by the end of the season. And that's a really hard pill to swallow, I'd imagine, for a lot of organizations. Yeah. Previously, the system we had where the, the two bottom teams would be given an opportunity to fight their way out of relegations. Now it's only the seventh place team, the eighth place team dead last, just automatically gone. You know, they've got 14 weeks to prove that they're not dead last. And mm. I think for a lot of squads, they they kind of realize and lose motivation when they start to see the numbers become quite a reality. And yeah. I think for organizations, I mean, if I'm running an organization, I don't know if I'm, you know, taking a, a gamble on a team that is likely to end up getting relegated anyway. Right, uh -huh. yeah. Um, and Taro, we're going to quickly move on from North America and across the pond to Europe. But before we dive into that, let's get the people at home ready with some highlights. He's going to be contested by this clash, as we uh -oh. mentioned, and there's really nothing that the Buck is going to be able to do. But Hicks falls, and despite that, Alfama is going to have to engage in some capacity. Turns his shield around, and Alfama, what a masterful clutch! It's Blasabot who will be tasked with possibly stopping the Diffuse from going down. He's getting the marks. Can he aim? What? No, you need to go for it, Blast, and he'll down him at the last second. And now Navi have a nearly unlosable post win. There you go. Why do you put four bodies out there? So three of them can cover as the plant goes down. A C4 missed, an Evil Eye missed, a Toxic Cancer missed, but oh my goodness! Empire of the Bags of Scythers two-piece, along with Karzeka, will now close this gap. Rips will shred through Shockwave. 
Empire taking a situation that went Scyther picking up a third kill. What? Ryan eliminates Corey, and everybody from Navi is dead because of the runout from Empire. How the hell does this even happen? Here we go, the aggression from Alfama. Uno's down, so it's just him in a one versus three now. He manages to take out Fabian, and he will narrowly miss on the planter. C4 misses, but the shots will not. As Jonas goes down, Alfama has managed to bring this much closer to a potential clutch. It's a one versus one. Alfama has so little HP, though, and Pengu will not be taken off of his position. As he plays the long angle, he only lands a single bullet, allowing Alfama even more clutch potential. He's going to try and stick it. Pengu, though, will hear this, relocates, and hits the shot for the first third. He's gonna oh. the head. No, oh, what a shot. Karzeka goes down. He could fake plant, but he's gonna go for the oh. ball. Oh, all right, Bruce, absolutely insane. Only one more, but he can. Another down, this time on two Alems. Fabian will clean up. Oh. And he goes uh. for it. <laughs> Unbelievable! Fabian with the three piece. Aha, G2 the Kings heading into the invitational. Their pro league form was pretty weak, though. But, Parker, you were never really worried about G2, right? I mean, you, you, you can't really ever be worried about G2. They are long considered, uh, you know, the top team that's ever played Rainbow Six. They're almost always uh, able to dig themselves out of a hole they should find themselves in. And uh, they don't find themselves in a playoff spot in Europe right now. Mm -hmm. But the math is absolutely there. And, I, and they are probably confident that they'll be able to grab one of those two spots. Uh, right now, I don't think anybody's catching Empire. Statistically, it's very improbable. So... Mm -hmm. It's really going to come down to that very final spot in Europe for the playoffs. Right now, the stream holds it, but I think, you know, if, you, if you've if got money and you're not betting on G2, then I don't really know what you're doing with that money. <laughs> <laughs> um, so G2 is very much, uh, pretty much, is back in form mm. uh, in the wake of the Invitational yeah. and their Invitational win. What's the difference between G2 online and offline? Mm. When you're playing in a setting on like a LAN environment, your experience really, really matters. You know, you can see your teammates, you can talk to your teammates a lot easier. There's a lot more pressure, uh, mm. especially if there's a crowd. There's a lot of things that go into it that I think you need to be prepared for. And a lot of these, a lot of these younger teams and inexperienced teams don't really understand how mentally taxing playing on LAN is versus online. Online, it's a lot more comfortable. You know, you're playing in your own chair, in your own home, you know, on your own desk, in your own specs, etc. With a team like G2, I, I I don't know offhand if there's a team that has played more LAN events outside of the Latin American region because they have like the BR6 where they all play on LAN every week. Mm. Um, I don't know if there's a team that has as much experience playing in a LAN setting and G2 just seems to thrive on that environment. They're very cool under pressure and I I just think that they like to revel in you know the the anger that a lot of fans throw their way because pe a lot of people that go to these events are cheering for people who aren't G2. Right. So isn't that the way? Yeah, it, whoever's the, the top team is always going to be kind of the the villain of the of tournament. Of course, they want them to be yeah. dethroned. Well, let's talk about the top of the table here because the stream and Empire emerging really as the online contenders. Empire really showed up at the Invitational and in Pro League since um, promoting, but uh, was this level was this the level you were expecting from EU's newest team? I was a little skeptical about what Empire was going to be able to do because mm. they did just come out of Challenger League. You know, they didn't have a ton of experience. The roster was still new. And holy smokes, they've been really good. Uh, right now, I mean, they're extremely dominant. They're eight points ahead of second place in EU. There's only 12 points left. So it's very unlikely that anybody's going to be able to catch them at this point for first place. They have just been doing a tremendous job. And the more we see of this team, the better they seem to be. But I will say, over the last two play days, it does kind of look like, uh, well, there's 15 points actually, technically, because we still have the matchup today. Um, 12 points after that. Um, I will say that it's, right now, I don't know which teams are going to be able to beat Empire. They look indomitable, and it looks like right now the only team that's capable of doing it is G2. Wow. Wow. Um, what about the stream's roster works better than the, mil the Millennium Core we yeah. saw at the start of last year? Uh, I think Millennium took a, you know, or, or Lestream rather, took a big step forward off of Millennium by changing up the language in which they communicate and mm. picking up the nationality of the players they can have, right? This used to be an all French squad. Mm -hmm. And while Lestream is very much a French organization, you know, they picked up a Finnish player and, you know, they picked up a German player in Aces. So it's like, 
you bring in added flexibility, but your comms will definitely suffer. You know, you've got five people all making calls in a language that is not their native language, and that can be tough for the players, and that can be a definite learning curve. And it's something that we've actually seen in a variety of other esports, and teams have not recovered when they've made that transition. So mm -hmm. I think it's pretty remarkable that Lestream has, has made such a good transition. I think that they have a very high potential, even though they're, you know, they're flaming out of group stages. Uh, oh, and two at the Invitational mm -hmm. was incredibly disappointing based on their past performance. But they have the opportunity to hold off G2 for this spot. Not only would that be a massive upset, I think, for a lot of people in, in Europe, but that'd be a huge boost for LSE. Uh, we should talk about a team not giving G2 any trouble at all um, now anyway, because Secret has been struggling. They're once G2's main rivals, now they're in last place. So what has gone wrong with Secret to fall so far so quickly after being one of EU's best teams for a good period of time? I, I have no idea what went wrong with Secret. You know, I, I think that they were very much a victim of operator bans and the meta mm -hmm. shifting. You know, they used Lion very effectively when they had Lackey on that role. I, the team decided that it was not worthwhile to keep Lackey on the squads. They made that roster move, uh, picking up Fonkers, who has proven to be, I, I would say, a very capable asset to the team and a really good addition. But there's always a learning curve when it comes to adding somebody new. I'm actually mm -hmm. kind of surprised with how well he's flourished in the mm -hmm. couple games that we've seen out of him because EU Pro League is just a meat grinder for a lot of players. It's really tough to step in and look comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, it looks to be the most competitive region in Rainbow Six. So to be able to step in and play as well as he did is, is a huge feather in his cap. Um, they've looked better as a team, Secret mm -hmm. has, over the last couple weeks, and I think that's what we should focus on, especially with Na'Vi. They're both on the ascendancy, which spells trouble for their opponents in Europe. Mm. And, it, you know, with that auto relegation spot in play, it's going to get real hairy in mm -hmm. regards to who is the team that kind of draws the short straw. I don't know if Secret is the worst team in, in European Pro League with how they've played over the last couple of weeks. So it's really anybody's game. Fair, bright side. Yeah, like uh, you mentioned Lion there. Mm -hmm. His rework is in the test service right mm -hmm. now. Any mm -hmm. initial reactions? Was was it the right direction for the operator? Mm -hmm. I mean, trying to balance that global ability without completely changing his identity, I would imagine, is, is a complete nightmare for the dev team. And, I, and they've, mm -hmm. from what it looks like, they've done a really good job. I haven't actually gotten to play him yet. I haven't been hands-on with his new ability. Judging from the way that I've seen, like, the clips of him being played, he looks, you know, a, a, almost defanged uh, in regards to the way he was. He went from being probably the most oppressive operator in the game to now what appears to be a minor nuisance. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, that's me saying that without any actual testing. That's me saying that without seeing him in a competitive environment. Mm -hmm. uh, the bigger problem is, is how do you balance global abilities? The devs, I think, have realized that they're not particularly enjoyed by the rest of the player base, which is why we've seen changes to Dokubi. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing changes to Lion as well. Uh, it would be nice to see Lion be in a position where he can actually be a, an attacker who has a role in a meta mm -hmm. without absolutely dominating it mm -hmm. but i don't know how his rework is going to play into that and frankly lion's still banned in pro league so i don't know if that if that ban is going to be lifted anytime soon yeah um and Tiro, we're almost out of time but you got a lot of fans that send in questions and we it would kind of be a shame for us not to answer a bunch of them so if your question doesn't get asked i'm really sorry if you sent one in but um we're gonna do our best to read as many of them as possible for you and Taro. Okay, so this one is from Marie Roy at Akviko asks, with hindsight, what tip would you give in Taro on his first day of Pro League? Uh, first day of Pro League, uh, wear a tie would have probably been my, <laughs> if, I could, if I could go back in time, um, and maybe don't match your dress shirt to your uh, blazer, but <laughs> no, just I would say I would say play off your co-caster more. You know, I had I, I think I had instant chemistry with with Kickstar when we first started casting, mm. and it was a really it was really nice to just be able to step into that and make it feel as comfortable as it did. But I still think that there were times where I could have listened and learned from the things he was saying in regards to strategies and the mm. way that he was casting, and played off of that better. It took a while for us to be able to get that under our belt, but. Uh, it's definitely something that, looking back, I would I would probably just be a bit more of a keen student of what he was saying. Mm. Mm. Well, um, Olivier Swainston asked, mm. "What is the most challenging thing you must overcome in order to be a great caster?" Ooh, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. The most challenging thing. 
honestly, I think for a lot of people, it's looking natural on a camera. Uh, and I think for another, you know, group of people, it's being able to speak confidently in a way that doesn't sound routine and makes it seem exciting. You know, like we already take enough flack as casters for just like repeating what's happening on the screen. You know, yeah. that old joke, like, why do we need people to tell us what's happening? We have <laughs> eyes for that. Right. Um, and I, I think as casters, part of your job is to be a storyteller. And if mm -hmm. you're not telling a story or you're not, you're not, you know, lending your casting to a certain narrative, then you're not doing your job correctly. Mm. Being able to do that quickly uh, in a compelling manner clearly is very difficult. And especially in a way that is exciting and worth listening to. There's a lot of different, you know, notes that you kind of have to hit at the same time. And for, for a challenge, it's just sometimes you need to be good at speaking clearly. That's really it. And a lot of people have to work hard to get there. For sure. I mean, also respecting your co-casters who are the analysts that you're with. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you guys have to have a little dance, a little rat-a-tat. Yeah, a lot yeah. of dancing. It's an art form. It <laughs> really is. Um, okay, so Gardner Moroff asks, why isn't Fuse played in Pro League? Uh, he's a three. He's a three armor, so he's slow. Uh, ah. You know, we see Montaigne get played as well, but Montaigne has a completely different ability. He's a three armor for Fuse. Uh, we did just see him in Latin America, but his usage was kind of surprising. I think for a lot of people, Sexy Cake on Liquid was using him, but Fuse's gadget just just doesn't really do that much you know it's mm. you got three cluster charges they're unpredictable you know they're very telegraphed because you can hear them coming a mile away and if you know there's a fuse on the board you're not going to sit still in a position where you're going to fall victim to those cluster charges they're mm -hmm. good for burning like utility like your ads's on defense will you know go bye bye pretty fast when those go off and you might be able to clear out any traps or anything underneath them but overall there's just there's other operators that bring better utility and better gadgets to the team that you need to rely on more and if you had a bit more flexibility and you didn't necessarily need to bring all the different tools that you do to attack a given site maybe his pick rate would be a little bit higher because the ak-12 is a great gun and he does have smoke grenades but at the end of the day there's just too many operators who do way more things than him that are you know far more helpful for, for the team better so he's just a bad character, unfortunately. <laughs> um, Valkyrie R6 asks, do you think R6 as a game and or esports is being held back by inaccessibility? Hmm. Um, I'm interested to know what they mean by inaccessibility. I think a lot of people talk about uh, how accessible the game is in terms of its learning curve. It is a really hard game to just jump into. And uh -huh. the fact that casual ranked and pro league don't really have an alignment in the rule set is equally confusing for a lot of viewers mm -hmm. um, and probably for players too who watch you know pro league and then go and, and play a game of casual or ranked and realize that the rules are, are very different mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I'd say accessibility is holding it back uh, I would say that a high learning curve is definitely a challenge for a lot of mm -hmm. people and the fact that there is a high learning curve with tons of depth actually brings more people back because mm -hmm. every game that you play is going to be different from one another no two games are the same mm -hmm. uh, the way that the map destruction works, the way that the different gadgets work. There's so many different ways that you can just do the same thing in Rainbow Six. So I I would say that there are obviously people who will be turned away from how inaccessible the game might be mm. due to that high skill ceiling. But I definitely think that there's equal parts, you know, people who are brought in and feel enriched playing a game that is as tough as Rainbow Six is. They also could just be talking about money because you have to pay for the game. Mm -hmm. And now so many games are free. But that's that true. was just my, that was just my take on it. the question. Uh, one more for you. Shagan on Twitter asked, how much do you love Kickstar? Uh, a lot. He's like a little, <laughs> he's like a brother to me. I, he's, you know, he's, he's younger than me. I, I feel like in a lot of ways, our relationship is very, you know, brother to brother. And it, it's one of those things where I liked him from the start. I always did. But as I got to know him better, I think our relationship changed from just coworkers to almost family. And it's it's really nice. It's nice to have somebody who you work with, who you care about them. I think in this business, you need to care about them. You can't just have a very neutral or you know blank relationship with the person you're sharing a desk with. I think you need to be friends with them and have that you know personal connection. And it's it's really nice to have somebody like that. He's been a you know Kickstarter's been a huge help to me 
so far in my career, not just by helping get me this opportunity, but also being somebody I can lean on when I'm feeling like my casting is not the greatest or if there's something going on that maybe I don't necessarily explain, I know that he's there to be non-judgmental and to possibly be able to put his voice to it instead. Oh my God, Ter mm, that was that's so, so sweet. sweet. Yeah. Um, and Tero, thank you so much for joining us and getting me, Zurich, Thanks. and everyone at home all caught up on our six. Thank you very much for having me. Oh my God, I love Intero so much, but I gotta say him talking about Kickstart gave me serious FOMO. Like, Zerk, why can't we have that kind of relationship? We do, just not do? us. The rest, oh. the rest of us is a very cohesive unit, but it's like, you know, me and you kind of, we're getting there, we're working, we're working. <laughs> <laughs> that hurts me. I thought, That's okay. I thought we had something special. You'll, you'll survive, Marissa. <laughs> You'll survive. <laughs> oh my God, we we're gonna get the hell out of here. That's it for us in Esports is Dirty, but uh, don't look sad. We've got five more days and five more games next week to nerd out over in the same time, in the same place. So it kicks off Monday with League of Legends, so brace yourselves. And if you need a regular dose of squad, hit us up in the socials at Squad State. Have a good weekend and uh, we'll see you back here Monday.